Hello and welcome to another episode of Mysteries with a History, where I'll take you on a wild ride into the unknown, the strange, and the mysterious. Like you, I have questions, and like you, I want answers. There's more to this world than what most think or believe, mysteries that stretch back into murky epochs of time, that hint of other realms, other worlds, and other intelligences. We're on this journey together. With each episode, we'll peel away the layers to look for the truth. There have been cases of close encounters with UFOs of various kinds where material evidence has been left behind. In this episode, we dig into those reports and accounts to shed light on this particular aspect of UFO sightings, from chunks of strange metal to environmental changes to unusual fibers, physical health effects, and other material evidence. But first, let me bring in Jimmy Church of Fade to Black Radio. Here we go. Jimmy, I see you moving around in the background. How are you, buddy? You did that on purpose. Did I? You saw me scoot. You saw me, uh-oh, and I had to go over there and flip some buttons. Oh, man. Did that. that was well done. That was well played. How you doing? Oh, my gosh. I'm doing so good. I got my cup of water going for me today. And I'm I'm ready to do this. Water. Yeah, water. Okay. All right. All right. You enjoy that water. Oh, it is. It's hydrating. Uh, I bet it's not as hydrating as this. See, you know the secret of coffee. It has water. That's how I get my water. There you go. That's how except, I hydrate myself. Except that makes you dehydrated. Gallons. That's that's urban legend, man. That's myth. Those are those coffee haters. Those are those coffee haters. So, uh, Christina, I, I just have to tell you, um, uh, great, great topic for today. And uh, I missed you this week. Normally, you and I are, are chatting and stuff. I was, I was very uh, uh, preoccupied this week, and and and. and, and didn't talk to you until today. Giving us teasers on 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 lives on Facebook. I, I thought you fired me. I thought I got canned. I was waiting for the email. Jimmy, clean out your desk. Just send send us send us back all the secret documents that and, that, and take all those spiders with you as well. Yeah, that was. Uh, oh, you're talking about yesterday. Um, yeah, out there in the desert. Yeah, that was uh, that was a lot of fun. That was really cool. I can't wait for. Uh, uh, this film to get released. It's going to be pretty soon. They're going to have the trailer done and uh, then I can start talking about it. But uh, I mean, even I'm in the dark, so I have no idea what yeah. this show entails, the movie, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I want to see yeah. it already. Well, see, you know, you know what they do um, and you're going to be uh, in this world here very soon. You don't have a choice. Um, you're going to be doing television and, and film and stuff, but, but this is what happens. They, they scare the crap out of you with these contracts, right? So you're signing these contracts. Doesn't matter. It could be, you know, some big network or uh, film or television, somebody small, independent, whatever. But it's always the same, you know. Uh, do not speak about this or we will sue you and your children forever, right? I mean, it's this fear of God thing. Until we tell you it's okay. Well, there's two things involved with that. One, I don't want my uh, daughter to to have to pay my debts. Number one, that's number one. Uh, and that's a small part of it. Um, but the second part of it, it's called ethics. So if you sign the contract, you abide by it. That's it. And it's called ethics. And and if I go and and talk about something or anybody does, that's the last thing you're ever going to do. Right. That's it. That's it. You are, and it, it's called ethics, man. And 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 so, yeah. So C, C production company. I didn't even tell Christina and I tell her everything. And I have no idea about this one. Nature yeah. Cam HD. Thank you so much for the super chat. Oh, it says, yeah. hello, Christina and Jimmy. I want to make another contribution to Christina's RV fund. Thank you. <laughs> Get the Coachman Freelander 22 X. G. Oh, that's good advice right there. Hold on. Don't take that down. Can I copy and paste that? Oh, you can't copy and paste it. You Hold on. Type it. Let's see what this looks like. Hold on. Coachman. Is it? 
Okay, hold on. Coachman. Coachman Freelander. What was it? 22XG. 22XG. Okay, X is before G, church. Okay, there we go. All right. Coach Lan- Coachman Freelander 22XG. Share the screen. We all want to see what it looks I'm like. Share it. Oh, this is sweetness. Is this what you have? Nature, is this what you've got? Okay, I'll share this. I'll share the stream. I I'm kind of uh I'm kind of digging this one. Okay, hold on for a second here. Um, in order to do this right. Um, okay, what's the show about? I'm gonna I'm gonna pull this up correctly. What's the show about today, Christina? Well, I had told you it's we're talking about UFO encounters where material evidence is left behind. And Christina, where did you get the idea for today's show? I got the idea from today's show from the interview I did with Preston Dennett when he talked about angel hair. And I'm like, we need to talk about that. I'll That's it. Into an entire it's show. Simple. It's, it's all on Preston Dennett. He is always causing trouble, that Preston Dennett guy. And, uh, okay, you ready? I'm ready. I want to okay, see it. Here we go. The Coachman Freelander 22XG as presented by trail cam oh nature cam look at that oh that's a beauty that's kind of what i have in mind yeah that's that see you could drive that see i thought you wanted some class a like a bus and you're going to be in there huh huh right but this this you could drive this you could drive this you I can think so. drive. i mean I, I would need to like practice in like the walmart parking lot first and then you know go from there <laughs> Yeah, it'd be a good start. Hit a few cars in the Walmart parking lot. A lot of people do do that. And uh, but but see, um, uh, the thing is this with with something like this, um, you don't don't ever back up. You, yeah, time. there's no rear view mirror. mirror yeah. So well, that's kind well, of scary. I back it up and th- you know, you know what I mean? But don't learn how to back up in something like this that you don't want to practice in. But uh, but the thing is, just always drive forward. If you got to back up, just do three circles. Just drive forward, <laughs> do three circles, and you'll get out of the parking lot somehow. Always drive forward. But you're going to be fine. This is great. Um, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty sweet. Thank you for that trail cam. Is it trail cam? Nature cam. Eight. Nature cam. Nature cam, trail cam, same thing, right? Kind of very similar. I mean, nature cam is like on bird's nest, right? Well, the cool thing about these kinds of of um, RVs is that some of them have like cameras to help you back up as well. So I think, yep, yep, yep. They all have that. They have sensors and and you know so. You're not going to hit anything if you're listening and paying attention. <laughs> yeah, so don't text and drive, guys. Yeah, right. But uh, that's great. Thank you for that trail cam and uh, nature cam. <laughs> but thank you. Let's let's get into today's show. There's a lot to cover. Let's get into it. As, as there is every single week, we pile it in with the notes and we just drop it like it's hot. So let's start with the thing that got me interested in it to do today's subject. And that's about angel hair. And when when I first heard it from Preston Dennett, I'm like, what the heck is that? Right. That sounds so obscure. How come I've never heard of this before? Right. And while that interview was done a good while ago before it was before my channel was caught on KUNX, um, I haven't heard of Angel Hair since. So it started with him and it ended with him, but it's not really going to end because we're going to continue it right here. But before we start, those in the live chat, have you ever heard of angel hair before? This this weird type of fibrous material. Okay. okay. Um, and while everybody's answering that, um, just, uh, just for grins, and uh, let's throw this over to chat too. What was the biggest angel hair case? And don't say Mama Maria's Italian kitchen in in Little Italy. That doesn't count. That's angel hair pasta. Which is delicious. Only takes like two minutes to make. It's like the best part of it. Well, some say her her pasta comes from heaven. They say. 
It, oh. it fell from heaven. Um, angel hair and star jelly. Yes. Okay. We're so going to get into was, that, my dear friend. What was the biggest case involving angel hair? So let's see. Uh, let's see. I, I, I'm just curious about this. Now, don't. Now, because Christina, too busy for me lately. Um, obviously, I just talked about that. She's too busy for me. Um, did not send me show notes. Okay. We so, were on the phone back and forth. And I was like, okay, I'm going to cover this one, this one, and this one. That was 20 minutes ago. What about last week? But here's the point. But but let's get to the point here. Um, I don't, I'm throwing this question out knowing that Christina and I have not talked about this. So I'm going to let the chat room go first. Trinity case answers. No, uh, good, good, good guess though. I, I, I like that. Okay. I'm going to throw it over to Christina. What was the biggest angel hair case? Was it the one in France in 1952? No, <clears throat> no, no. Good guess though. Good guess. Good guess. Good guess. Tell me. Are you sure? I I am ready. I am ready to learn, Jimmy. That's why we do these shows. I'm ready. Okay. Canada. Canada. All right. You know what? Tell us the story. Shag Harbor. Tell us the story, Jimmy. Shag Harbor. What's Shag Harbor, here? 1967. Shag Harbor. So the UFO comes in, um, skips across the water, goes under the water, and discharges angel hair, which was seen in the sky, floating on top of the water and floating under the water. And the rescuers going out, they thought it was a plane crash. And so they went out uh, to hopefully rescue some people and ended up scooping this stuff out of the water and it was on top of the water too as well. Bizarre. Yeah. 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 Angel hair. And it, it, it you know, what's it's uh, not angel hair, by the way, just, it looks like angel hair. But I just oh, want to okay. make that clear. Yeah. 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 And angel hair kind of came and went. So was it like a species of, of ET that was visiting that's no longer here that, had this angel hair pasta uh, situation that was going on. Don't know. No, I'm being serious. Or it was it was it not real? Right? Was it just something else? You know, like protoplasm and and all of the stuff from seances in the 1930s and 1920s. Well, I some do make a connection to that, but I think for the most part, what people are speculating, just because no one has been able to take it into a lab, because after it's been collected, a certain time, a certain um, a little time after, it just kind of dissipates. Falls apart. It just falls apart, which right. is so you, we've had scientists and we'll go into detail on that that have collected it. They put it in a jar. They sealed it. They're like, all right, I'm going to take you to the lab a little bit later today. I'm mm -hmm. going to run some tests. Mm -hmm. They look at their jar a little bit later and it's just gone, just mm -hmm. disappeared. Mm -hmm. But there are some that believe that this could be related to some type of like discharge from the from UFO craft. And one sighting in particular happened in 1952 in France, October 17th. And according to one of the many witnesses, high school superintendent Jean Gieves, Prigent, and please, my French is atrocious. I cheated my way through French in high school. So there appeared to be a cottony cloud of, of strange shape, and above it, a narrow cylinder apparently inclined at a 45-degree angle was slowly moving in a straight line toward the southwest. And this is a quote from the superintendent, and it continues. And a sort of plume of white smoke was escaping from its upper end. In front of this cylinder, which we'll classify as a UFO, was... 30 smaller objects that, when viewed through opera glasses, proved to be a red sphere, each surrounded by a yellow ring. And these saucers moved in pairs, following a broken path categorized in general by rapid and short zigzags. When two saucers drew away from one another, there was a streak kind of like an electric arc was produced between them. And here is a rendition. Where is my rendition of it? Here it is. 
So here is one rendition of what this superintendent was kind of referring to when he saw this instant. Here we go. Mm. Where you're having these kind of Saturn looking craft that are discharging this weird kind of silky type of material. But this isn't the first time this has happened. Actually, 10 days later, the identical thing happened just a few miles away from its original location. So this, this type of material, like I had mentioned a little bit earlier, there haven't been any laboratory analysis because once again, when scientists have collected it, such as Craig Phillips, director of the National Aquarium from 1976 to 1981, placed it in a steel jar, he got to the lab, and it was no longer there. And this was in Florida, by the way. But what he was able to describe this material as well. Like, it, it wasn't really cotton. It wasn't sticky and it wasn't a web like what many would possibly consider to be a type of spider web. They're like, oh no, what you're seeing is just, is just spider web and nothing more. But this has been going on for quite some time. And maybe, Jimmy, just maybe there was a different name for it in the past. And what was that, Christina? Well, the Welsh name for it is powder sewer. And this is kind of also this mystical substance of star jelly, that creepy little book I just mentioned a little bit earlier. And mm -hmm. that's been observed since the 1400s. Mm -hmm. But is that the same thing? Well, it is very hard to say. But one of the first documented sightings was back in 1846. And a luminous object estimated at about four feet in diameter fell at in, in New York, leaving behind a heap of foul smelling luminous jelly that disappeared quickly, according to Scientific American. Then, in 1950, four Philadelphia policemen reported the discovery of a dome disc of quivering jelly. Mm. <laughs> Stella, uh, kind of quivers. And it was six feet in diameter, one foot thick at the center, and an inch or two near the edge. And when they tried to pick it up, it dissolved into an odorless, sticky scum. And this is this is this is getting very very interesting, and um, I had never heard of of those accounts. And then, very similar, by the way, there are some accounts with angel hair that uh, was described as exhaust mm -hmm. coming out of the back of the craft as they're flying and leaving this suspended in the air, like you know jet exhaust, except this is uh, a permanent you know, cottony cloud of this white stuff that would, would come down uh, to the ground. And then uh, when it was uh, touched, when it was observed, it, it changed state and uh, disappeared. Uh, there's always been uh, smell and odor um, along with this. And you're going to have smell or odor with, with just about anything, right? Right. So a uh, very, very interesting. The angel hair, um, of course, you have Trinity, uh, the Trinity case with uh, Jacques Vallée and, and Paula Harris um, in their book where I think didn't the family like keep it on their fireplace or something for a while and decorate the Christmas tree with it? I, I don't recall that, but I think that would be a really fantastic detail if that was the case. Yeah, because it would glow so they didn't have to get Christmas lights. Hey, you got to be innovative, right? Work smarter, not harder. But but that this this was collected by uh, the family and kept in the house for for decades. Their version of it was it angel hair? Was it something else? Don't know. Uh, but they did literally decorate their Christmas tree with it each year, um, and I believe it glowed when it was touched. I I, I could be wrong. I have to go. I have the book right here. I'd have to go back and. And, and check that out. And we're going to talk about Jacques Vallée again 
um, in a little bit. But yeah, angel hair. Okay, what's next? Well, one more thing on that, um, because it seems like angel hair and maybe this type of star jelly could be somewhat different, or maybe they could be similar in a different state, right? When you're dealing with a fibrous and they could turn into jelly or vice versa. We simply don't know because there just isn't enough information on it, but it is something that's incredibly fascinating. Well, scientists commissioned by the National Geographic Society have carried out tests on samples found in the United States, but have failed to find any DNA in that material when it comes to that like gel- gelatinous aspect of it. Mm-hmm. So I, I w- did want to mention that before we continue. And Dan, thank you. Do you want to read this one, Jimmy? Dan's a troublemaker from Australia. I'm just letting everybody know that, right? I haven't even read this and I know <laughs> that there's trouble involved. You'd think perhaps there's something to it given that it has happened at major events like the 1561 Nuremberg incident and the miracle of Fatima in 1917. And there you go. Dan James is also a UFO and angel hair pillar of knowledge from Sydney, Australia. (laughs) Yes, he's right, though. And uh, the Nuremberg incident uh, had reports of this. Um, There are versions uh, I, I think it could be interpreted as angel hair and the woodcut prints uh, that are out there. And, of course, absolutely, Fatima. Um, two two things that Christina and I didn't bring up as we're putting our list together. And we had to go overseas uh, for the real stuff. Appreciate that, Dan. Thank you, man. Thank you. Now let's jump into our next one. Jimmy, I picked the first one. I'll let you go over the next one. Where do you want to take this? Let's go... Let's go with one of my favorites. Um, I'm going old school, though. Uh, All right. I'm going old school. Uh, so for you kids out there that um, let me pull up the image first, and then I'll tell everybody about it. No, I'm, you are going to queue up the image. I'm going to have the image ready, but you're not going to fire it up Got until it. I, I'll give you a wink. I'll give you a nod. I'll give you one of these. And then and then you, yeah, exactly. Got okay. It, got it. But make it like really dr- like dramatic, please. Uh, well, I'll make it dramatic. <laughs> I'll make it dramatic. Okay, let's see here. We're going with this one right here. Okay, all right. This is um, this is a, a story that was was very very big news uh, when I was a kid. And uh, 1985 86, this story broke out. And this involved a musician. Um, His name was Bob White. And Bob White uh, was driving around uh, Christina's favorite place in the world, Skinwalker Ranch. I was going to be like a ramen shop. Right. right. Well, he was actually. (laughs) Right, right. right. He was actually in Grand Junction, Colorado. It's 50, 100 miles away from Skinwalker Ranch. When he says that um, he observed a UFO. And pulled over, watches the UFO. It was late at night, and and this light uh, seemed to uh, approach his car. And right. uh, he pulls over, gets out to you know take a closer look. Always the the mistake that you never do, but he does right. So he gets out, does the Travis Walton <laughs> right? What is that? And he and and it, it gets really close to his car. And then uh, the thing starts dropping these orange glowing things. He doesn't know what they are um, from the craft and and drop into the grass uh, next to him. He goes to the trunk of his car and he uh, gets a pair of gloves out. And now these things are smoldering hot and glowing. He waits for them to cool down and then he picks it up. And so with that, oh, hold on. I have to, I, I was going to give you the nod. It's a good thing I didn't give you the nod because that wouldn't have worked, right? <laughs> but but this will. Okay, Christina. Uh, okay, does that mean I show it now? That's That, that was it. Okay, so um, everybody take a look at this object. Um, it has been described as some say it was, you know, shaped like a, a carrot of, a, you know, some type of vegetation. Um, it certainly looks organic. It's scaly. It's metallic, by the way. 
Um, the total object was about uh, uh, eight inches long. Parts of it were cut off as, and sent out for testing. You can see in the lower left-hand corner, um, it's lopped off on one end. The top picture in the right-hand corner, you can still, it has a point on it. That was cut off later, um, so it's got a flat end on it uh, that was also sent out for testing. Um, but there it is. Um, and you can see here, I think it's 10 inches long. Uh, still in the top picture, I think the existing, the way it sits today, uh, it's six or seven inches long. Um, the picture in the upper left-hand corner is a bit stretched. Um, I couldn't find, except for the lower lower left, which is uh, uh, how it looks normally. Uh, but anyway, so it was sent out for testing, and and Bob insists, I think... Uh, he sent it to Los Alamos uh, in New Mexico uh, to the laboratory, and he says the result of the testing, Christina, was uh, uh, definitely extraterrestrial, and that's a quote. But a uh, steel factory uh, foreman control supervisor, his name was Ian Harrison, stepped in and said that he's used several of these objects as garden ornaments next to his gnomes. He said, because they're made of accreted grinding residue, it forms in a manner similar to common stalagmite when metal castings are cleaned on large stationary grinders. Now, that doesn't mean that the case um, uh, was deflated, right, and that it went away. It didn't. Uh, Mr. White stuck to his story. Um, this was uh, before Coast to Coast. This is before um, uh, uh, that area became this UFO hotspot. Um, remember, this is 1985. Um, it's all very interesting. Or is it that uh, there was no UFO? He just got a cool piece of metal and he made up a story and the story got away from him. Again, we don't know. Um, uh, I have tried, and I think others uh, have have attempted to get uh, the results of the testing done, um, uh, the other testing, and it kind of has faded away over time. But it is still a big part of ufology, and the story still stands because nothing was actually debunked. But there is... The famous, I mean, this tore up. Christina, back in 1985, 86, in the UFO world, this is all we talked about, right? Yeah, here. It, was, it was insane. Yeah, it was a big, it was a big deal. It was a really, really, really big deal. I think what blows my mind is the fact that he used it in his garden. No, that was, um, that was the engineer. Yeah, like that's heartbreaking. I mean, if, if it really is evidence of oh, some no, kind. No, no. No, 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 no. The engineer says that this stuff is garbage and he he collects it and uses it in his garden and that he knows what it is. He didn't put the actual Bob White fragment in his garden. No, he didn't do that. Oh, okay, got it, got it, got it. <laughs> I've been like, oh, my heart. <laughs> You're so you're so sensitive, trying. you know, and I really that is just awesome. I'm uh, only sensitive when it comes to cats. Like you'll definitely see some tears coming down if they're like super cute. Well, see, that was the second half of the story. That engineer yes. will bury cats in his garden. Yeah. Instantly. Don't don't, don't don't leave me wide open for stuff like that. Okay. <laughs> let's let's um let's continue. Okay, now Okay, I'm going to do one more because I have a All special right. treat um, that uh, this one involves me. Oh, let's hear the story. Uh, what? Okay. What? Okay. <laughs> what? Oh, first, Sir Grizz, thank you so much. It says, better late than never. You guys rock. You Sir Grizz buddy. coming in. Man, you know, $5... It, it, it's so important uh, because of uh, what we're doing here and the graphics that need to be done to adorn this RV. But I'm going to tell you, we keep doing this five bucks, five bucks a crack like that week after week. That thing is going to be dope. 
Okay. Yeah. All right. Just, just you wait. Just it's, you wait. It's, it's going to be happening. Happening. A big alien ramen eating bowl of. It's going to be awesome. Okay. Can it be a plushie? A plushie. <laughs> Those are so cool. No, I'm talking about a wrap. We got to wrap it. We're going to wrap this thing. Do you know how to wrap? Uh, yeah, I can wrap. Can you freestyle? I can freestyle. Let's hear it. I can freestyle right now. Okay. Christina, in a second, I'm going to give you the nod, the secret nod that only you and I have. Okay. Nobody knows about it. Okay. So I'm going to give you the nod and then you're going to post this. Um, this one involves me. And back in uh, 2013, so this is nine years ago, uh, back in 2013, I was contacted by an individual that um, had a piece of the Roswell crash piece is and uh, wanted to send uh, some of it to me and also sent me uh, high res photographs, high, 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 high res uh, photographs of of the object and said, Jimmy, this is your story. Run with it. I've given you all of the details. And uh, now I'm going to leave that part of it right there. You can go, if you go back to the uh, internet way back machine and you, and you look for this, you know, Jimmy church, UFO debris, 2014, you'll get the uh, original article that I wrote up and stuff. So we, we, we're not, we don't need to do that here. And a, uh, a, uh, uh, more images, but, uh, today, um, it was really funny. Uh, I was, uh, actually it wasn't today. It was last night. I was searching UFO debris on the internet, right? And my, no what I'm showing you popped up first, right? It was pretty funny. So go ahead, share it. This is the image. Um, and what's funny, this is how, I posted it back then uh, with JimmyChurchRadio.com twice, just in case somebody made a mistake. I have no idea what that means. But uh, but this is the image as pulled from the Internet. So you can go and look. And there's other images, too, as well. Um, <clears throat> now, I put this out there. Uh, I, I had uh, uh, quite a few different researchers take a look at this. Uh, mm -hmm. I sent it to Linda Moulton House, sent it to Robert Morningstar. Uh, I think Jacques Vallée uh, got this. Uh, Dolan certainly got it. You know, I sent it sent it out to everybody, and it wasn't so much of, of an analysis of this piece, trying to determine what it is, because you can't do that from a photograph. Um, but uh, I wanted to know if anybody had seen this piece before. It, you know, was somebody else out there claiming this? Did it did it fall through the cracks, or is this story real? Um, so I I did my due diligence on it, and and I released the article and and put it out there. And to this day, that was nine years ago. Uh, nobody's really debunked it. Um, I've had a few different uh, comments that I'll, I thought all of it was interesting. Now, this is, by the way, th I, this is a totally high-res image. So if you zoom in, you can see these grooves. You see those grooves? Mm -hmm. Like the edge of a coin. You see that? And that goes all over this object. Those grooves are there all the way up. Now, so when you look, I'm not talking about the grooves that you see here, the wide grooves, it's what's going on in between there. You see that? And it's, uh, it's very interesting. And this is, uh, an extremely, I'm blowing it up huge here. So yeah, that's impressive. Yeah. And so the, the high resolution it is, it is. And everything that I was sent was, uh, was high resolution, high res. Um, so it, it is interesting. Um, I was more concerned with, um, at the time, uh, having the story already out there and it was debunked and somebody's just sending me pictures and, and, and messing with my head. But uh, here we go. It's, it stood the test of time. And if anybody out there remembers this or has any updates, uh, you know how to get a hold of me. It says it right there. Jimmy church radio.com. Pretty cool website, by the way. Um, if, uh, if you would like to go and check that out. So that's my UFO debris. Now I had, uh, I'm only, Today's show's not about me. It's about Christina. 
But here's the thing. It's not about me either. It's about the subject. I've been sent so many uh, uh, pieces of stuff. Um, uh, I have uh, probably three or four uh, pieces and chunks of alleged UFO debris. Um, I've, I've got lots of pictures. I've got lots of stories. But this is this one. Um, not that any of them have been resolved, but this one, I just love the the image. And and it looks really, really cool. And I can't think of anything that it relates to. It doesn't, you know, and so I think it's cool. It's a cool image. Great story. Roswell, 1947. And there you go. So then while we're on the topic of debris, should we talk about arts parts? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do arts parts. I mean, if we're going to, we got to talk about the most famous case, right? Heck Yeah. Well, here we got Mr. Art Bell, and this is a really interesting story. So what we're looking at is back in 1996, Art Bell received a very lengthy letter from a man that said he was involved with someone that was a part of the retrieval for the Roswell UFO crash. And in that letter, he also sent debris and here is a picture of it sec. here we go here's a picture of that debris and this piece of debris has gone through many hands not that many but a good amount of hands in this letter and it's a very long i'm not going to read all of it but it pretty much says Dear Mr. Bell I followed your broadcasts over the last year or so and I've been considering whether or not to share with you and your listeners some of the information related to the Roswell UFO crash. My grandfather was a member of the retrieval team sent to the crash site just after the incident was reported. He died in 1974, but not before he had sat down with some of us and talked about the incident. I'm currently serving in the military and hold a security clearance and do not wish to go public and risk losing my career and commission. That's how he starts this letter. We don't know who this person is. It's still anonymous. But this piece, this odd looking piece of material went from Art Bell, then to Linda Moulton Howe. And Linda did an extensive extensive amount of testing on this on this um, object and going from place to place laboratory to laboratory she wasn't really able to find definite answers of what this piece was and really where it came from so after she had it from such a long period of time in 2018 she ends up selling it to who, Jimmy? TTSA. That's right. Mr. TTSA. Tom DeLong. And there, what I found really interesting, and I, again, like, I place all of the articles and the um, pieces of information that I use in the description box below. There was an article written by Vice that had interviewed molten how on this whole situation this this piece of material why she sold it and where it is now and pretty much linda sold this 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 object over to ttsa for thirty five thousand dollars, and tom delong approached her and said look i know you're not finding the proper labs to do the testing that you want which requires an extensive amount of energy i think i might know a specific lab that can find those answers but i need that material from you i'll buy it she's like okay i'll sell it to you and he ends up getting hold of it and working with to my knowledge the u.s army to research that material as well and Vice had asked, I think this is a valid question. Vice asked, so Linda, why did you end up selling it for $35,000? And she said, I figure I spent around $900 to $2,000 a year from 1996 to 2019 in the various things that I've done to go ahead and run those tests. So thirty-five dollars seemed appropriate. And I don't necessarily disagree with her 
on, on that aspect. You know, when you're really trying to find the answers, you're going to throw as much money as it needs because when you're looking for the truth, whatever that may be, we simply don't know. I think it's worth every single penny. Who cares? Sell it. Sell it. Sell it. Well, she sell had it for it. a really, really long time. I guess so. Two Who decades. Business of it. Anybody that complained about that, um, you know what? Uh, please take that energy and, and go feed the homeless. But don't worry about what Linda Moulton Howe is or isn't doing because it's none right. of your business. Period. 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 Um, I, I, she took Tom for all the money. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> good, good, good. You know, and and you know, and yeah, whatever that stuff turns out to be, and how put off gets involved, and the army got involved. It's now their problem. All right, and, and there's a lot of hands involved in this. But but trying to prove or disprove uh, something that has alien origin, Linda is absolutely right. That stuff costs money. And and everybody, are not cheap. No, no, no. And and everybody wants to come at you know the people that have stuff like this, like Linda, going, "Why don't you have it tested? Hey, man, why don't you go and get it tested? Why don't you go and get it tested? Right? If, if, pay for it. Here, here, here is <laughs> here's what it costs. So why don't you pay for it? Let's go run some tests. No, well, that's not what I was saying. Well, you know what? Save that. And it's one of the things that exhaust me about the UFO community when they just don't get it. So if Linda spent a grand a year for, for whatever, and, and she needs to get her money back and then let somebody else absorb the cost of that. Good on her. Good on her. That's it. It's, it's not like she, she profited and I don't care if she did profit, sell to him for a hundred grand, make $75,000, put it in your pocket. You know, go take a trip, Linda. You 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 deserve it. You earn it. But that's none of my business, and it's none of yours. It's and, simply not. And that's sell the mentality for, to have. Right. Sell it for a million dollars. I don't care. Good on you. It doesn't matter. But 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 the case is an interesting one. The layers on it are interesting. Um, I, I don't know what happened with uh, the U.S. Army. They've, they've sort of talked about it, but they haven't. If it is indeed the same piece of material uh, that TTSA gave to the Army with the CRADA agreement, um, I know that Hal Putoff had looked at it for, for a while. So and others, and I believe uh, even Jacques Vallée had his finger in that for a minute, too, and did some testing on it as well. So um, there you go. It was never dismissed as nothing. It, it right. never was. It never was. And so much so that, uh, the, you know, Army, uh, the Army got involved and is paying for the research to go into that and uh, to see what it's made up of. And, and there you go. It's, it's, it's end of the story. So uh, but it's one of the most interesting cases though, when it comes to uh, UFO debris. It definitely is. And she specifically wanted to run terahertz tests. And that's incredibly difficult to do. And that's where Tom DeLong came in and said, hey, look, I think I know a lab that can go ahead and run those specific tests. Because she had believed that if if this material is able to go under terahertz tests, maybe then it could levitate. And I was like, whoa, I want to see that. I want I want to be there when they're running those tests. Right. Are you joking? Right, right, I'm right, there. Right. Well, I'll bring the snacks. That's how they built the pyramids. Okay. So um, uh, you did arts parts. Is there a follow-up on arts parts or are we... No, unfortunately, we, we just don't know what currently has happened with that object, where the U.S. Army is with all of this. I think the only person that might know that might be Tom DeLong, as he was working alongside him when it came to uh, approaching Moulton Howe for this object. Right, right, right. Um, I think that the latest comments about that, and uh, I think it was John Greenwald did a FOIA uh, search on that, too, as well, um, when he did his creative research. You know, to kind of close the story and find out where it was at. And they said, you know what? It's still an ongoing agreement. So they, uh, I'm talking about the Army. That was the Army's response. So uh, apparently the testing is still uh, is still ongoing. 
I mean, do you think do you think that's saying something? Do you think that's that's worth considering saying if if they're still running tasks, if we still don't have answers yeah. Yeah. at least publicly, is that yeah. saying that like it could yeah. be? I I would I would like to think so. Um I, I mean, of course, I, we would all hope for that. Um there was uh Hal put off did a couple of uh, uh public presentations uh about this and where he discussed the meta materials and and I think he got into some terahertz conversations and things. And um, now, although Hal is is pretty um, uh, uh, protective of using words like aliens and ET and this and these definitive, it's one hundred percent this. Right. Um, no, no scientist goes one hundred percent on anything. Um, so it, he's been very cautious uh, about this. But this, he has he has stood behind this material, um, uh, and and this this goes. I think his last presentations were about three years ago uh, about the metamaterial uh, stuff, uh, but he had been looking at it for a very, very long time. The cross section of it looks is, looks very interesting, but I don't know. I don't know what I'm looking at. And uh, not only um, Christina with with arts parts, um, we're looking at images of it. All right, right. And, and from that, that's. I, I might as well be holding up this pair of glasses. You know, I don't know what th these are made of, you know? So, but you need to have a, an electron microscope. You need to get, break this down. You need to see the construction and how it's held together at, uh, at extreme magnifications and take a look at that and then know what to compare it to with other stuff uh, here on earth that we manufacture and then is found in nature. Right. That's what, you, and I don't have that kind of expertise. And so if it has taken this long uh, for the United States Army and Hal Putoff and Jacques Vallée and, and, you know, how many people have done analysis on this to try to come to some conclusion and pretty much it's still sitting there. So I don't, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. I'm, I would love for it to be alien. I, I really would. I would love for it to, to have originated not of this earth. I mean, at the end of the day, whatever the truth may be, we we simply can't place our opinions and our bias and saying, well, I really hope it is. I mean, look, of course, I would love for it to be extraterrestrial. That would be amazing because then that would show something that we're not we're not crazy. But for, for the most part, Whatever it may be, I really hope that we'll know those answers, that that information will be made public, if not, you know, voluntarily, then through FOIA. Okay, so this is where um, Christina won't say these things, but I will. She, she'll be talking like this in about six months, though. She's getting those gloves on. I'm is ready to have that 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 deep voice. Broken glass and whiskey. First thing in the morning, you got to gargle and uh, uh, finely ground glass and uh, French crystal uh, works Probably. really well. Uh, okay. Okay, but but it's this. All right, let's just put it out there. TTSA was supposed to be this public benefit corporation where they were going to take alien technology and give it back to the people. We were going to have anti-gravitic uh, uh, space liners connecting, right, Rome with Manhattan, and we were going to have all free energy, and we were going to, it's all the things. You know, that, that was the promise, okay? And TTSA and Tom DeLonge made an agreement with the United States Army and the Department of Defense giving what could be alien metamaterial and handing it over to the Department of Defense just gave it to them. And I felt very uncomfortable with that. What is, uh, what is, if it's, let's say it's alien and they are able to develop something from that. For what? For us? For me? So I can have a, a really cool car or something for the military? And that's uncool. And I never felt right about that. 
And so when you ask me uh, what's going on, they still have it. Do you think, you know what? Maybe it is pretty interesting to them. And maybe they will be. I heard talk that this meant a material was leading to invisible tanks. That's not what this was, you know, uh, that's not what that's for. You know, it, it's it's for us. It's for the people. And it's just it's just something that I felt very uncomfortable with. And and it's very tough for me to to agree uh, to why uh, Tom made that deal. Um, I, that's the last thing I would I would do with alien parts is take it to the army, take it to the Pentagon and go here, you know, let, get back to me. You can have it. If anything is developed from this, it's your technology, which is the nature of the CRADA agreement, by the way. They pay for the lab testing. They tell you about it, but they get to keep the tech. Think about that. All right. So that's it. I'm off my soapbox. I mean, it's it's disappointing. At the end of the day, everyone has their own agenda. Let's talk about the Mari Islands incident. Now, we've done an entire show on it, but for those that haven't watched it and that don't know this case, let me tell you, you are in for a treat because this is such a cool story. So back in June of 1947, off the coast of Mari Islands in uh, Washington, a man named Harold Dahl was out on his boat with his son, Christopher, their dog, and two hired ship workers. So according to Mr. Dahl, on June 21st, 1947, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, six unidentified flying objects appeared in the sky above his boat. One of the saucers began wobbling as if it was having problems, and then an explosion occurred in the middle of it and like a kind of hot molten metal substance started raining down from the sky landing in the water and on the boat causing a sizzling causing a bunch of sizzling killing the family dog and then also breaking his son's arm that's already pretty extreme but sorry i was muted but it gets weirder it does it and i'm going to share my screen for those that want to have a visual dun, dun, dun. that is kind of what it looks like christy thank you so much it says that's why linda didn't give all of her samples to ttsa she was on ancient aliens friday show for samples under the high security storage i watched that one and you're right so i am happy that she didn't give it all away but she did give it a good piece of it but thank you so much for the super chat so here is an image of this incident. And if you zoom in, you can see the men in black and we're going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica Rodriguez, man, man, man. That's cool. Thank you for the RV fund. It's going to happen. It's going to happen in a year or less, hopefully less, but we're going to see. So continuing on with this story, he ends up telling his superior captain, he collects some of the debris, obviously, who wouldn't? And then the very next day, men in suits knock on his door and ask Harold to tell him the entire story of what happened. But if you were to tell anyone what you just saw, bad things are going to happen to you, but not just to you, but to everyone you love. Now, if that's not a threat, I do not know what is. Horrifying threat. but. It gets even weirder than that. It so does. then on August 1st, 1947, 40 days after the incident, Harold Dahl was uh, seen by two military officials and, and asked to give the agents the debris that Harold had collected. And then the men placed them on their B-25 bomber. So the... The plane was thoroughly inspected two weeks before this date, but several minutes after liftoff, the plane crashed. Two pilots died and two people left with parachutes. Now, it's believed that it was an internal fire that caused the crash, but some UFO researchers believe that the box of debris collected from Harold was what caused the plane crash. Oh, it gets stranger. Come on. It gets crazier. 
No, go ahead. Tell me the rest of it. I, I said the main chunk. Go for well, it. Well, but but see, this is this. Is, okay, uh, let's let's uh, let's talk about the other stuff that was going on at the same time. You had Roswell, right? You, uh, the month uh, at the same time. By the way, Maury Island was first uh, was reported uh, before Kenneth Arnold um, in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, Mount Rainier, and uh, obviously before Roswell. So Maury Island uh, kicks off first. So we've got the craft, we've got the debris, we've got the stuff, the, the things are collected. We've got planes crashing, we've got people dying, we've got all of that. Then, uh, then, then, then Kenneth Arnold, and then Roswell, all in the same two to three week period. Um, it, it was crazy town. So you can't we we can't ignore the facts of the case, all right? But then this is where I'm looking at the clock. We've got so much other stuff to to do. But everybody listen to me for a second. If we are going to crazy town, if we really want to wonder what the government knows and how things are connected, Fred Christman and Dahl, right? Fred Christman comes in from the FBI, and now he's investigating the case. This is 1947. Fred Christman gets a box of debris. Um, a couple of uh, weeks later, after the Kenneth Arnold case, mm -hmm. right? He takes, Fred Christman goes to Kenneth Arnold, right? Flying saucers. Goes to Kenneth Arnold and shows him the debris and asked him if if it looked familiar. You know, he had just had the, the UFO sighting of the nine crafts, and and that was huge news. And as everybody knows, that's where the term flying saucers came from. So there's that. Fred Chrisman of the FBI, um, who's connected to Hoover and everything, obviously, right? Fred Chrisman, uh 15 years later, not quite 20, Fred Chrisman, 15 years later, is involved in the JFK assassination and, and, and goes even further. It goes beyond that, too, as well, and may even tie into the Apollo space program and, and back up. And it might in, involve the Soviets and, and Soyuz and the first rockets that were launched in the 1950s. And then it back up, back up, back up. Fred Chrisman is also involved. In the Maury Island UFO crash and the collection of debris in the original investigation. Coincidence? I think not. I think not. That's one that's of my why, favorite memes. That's why. <laughs> but see, this is the thing. Um, uh, for, for people that research uh, UFOs, they're listening to the show, Christina, and that's great. Uh, they're watching documentaries and, and, and they're doing their thing and they have an interest in the topic. And then maybe if, if uh, you know, things are cool and stuff, maybe they'll back up uh, and, and go before Roswell and uncover the Maury Island case and they'll do that. That's great. Take things to the next level. When you go and you find out the name of the original FBI agents, I'll go plural because there were there was more than one, and then go and follow their career, go and Google their name and see what things that they are involved with, right? And it's crazy. I mean, it's absolutely nuts. And this is the part of of UFO research that I enjoy so much that it's not just you know, Roswell and and weather balloons. That's right. right. Because that's what people think of, right? That's, 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 once you go and dig a little bit deeper and then get into Kenneth Arnold, back up a little bit, go to Maury Island, take a little bit of effort and start looking at who's researching the case. Turn around and Google those names and look at what you have to go and follow up and read through. It's, it's absolutely nuts. And that's why, for me, well, all cases are great. But Maury Island, that is a crazy. And before anybody starts to dismiss this case uh, because of some little thing here and there, you need to continue to do the deep dive. There is something to Maury Island. There really is. 
that it's 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 one of those cases that's high up there. But I want to talk about my fav my favorite UFO case of all time. My favorite case, and it's so appropriate for today. And that's the Calaris Brazil incident back in 1977. Now we've covered it a few times. For those that haven't watched the show that we did on it, an extensive show, watch it. I'm telling you, this is one of my favorite stories. And here's why. A lot of the times when people have a sighting or an encounter, for the most part, putting aside alien abductions, um, it's it's not vicious, okay? The aliens are not necessarily terrorizing people. In this case, in 1977, for six whole months, every single night at around 7 or 8 p.m., you had multiple craft hovering over the town of Kolaris, shining a beam of light and just terrorizing the townspeople there. And what's very interesting about this story, there's a lot of things that are very interesting about this, but you have a lot of collected evidence. You have 3,000 witness testimonies. You have a bunch of photos, drawings from the military that went to this town to take notes on this because the the mayor of the town was like, I need to call the capital. This is getting too intense and people are becoming too scared. I need to call in for backup. So he was expecting the military to come with guns and tanks and weapons. But what did they come with, Jimmy? What did they come with instead? I'm listening. Well, they ended up coming with pens, papers, cameras, telescopes. I was going to say laser beams. <laughs> no laser beams here. But no, you're right. They they were they were prepared. They were prepared intellectually yes. not to protect the town. And these beams of light, it seems that based off of the witness testimonies, which there has been a FOIA report on, you can find it on the Black Bolt website. And it seems that when these people were shined with a beam of light, they would receive puncture wounds as well. So it, it, it seemed like there were like these really, really tiny needles in these beams of light. And for women, it would hit them in the chest area. And for men in the jugular area, of course, also in the, the, the chest and in the thighs as well. And, and you, weren't just, safe. you weren't safe anywhere. Not, not even in your own home. No, no, no. Can you imagine the terror? Right. Especially if you're a parent with kids and, and things where uh, you've got stuff flying around your city. And there's you know, nothing you can do. Nothing you can do. Nothing. They will puncture wounds in the chest. You know, that's that's crazy. That's crazy. Anyway, continue. Well, the, probably the craziest part about this, because, again, we are dealing with evidence where you had a lot of information collected by the military that has now been released through FOIA. But I think one of the craziest stories about this is that the the captain of this operation, Operación Plato, also had encounters as well. Not only close encounters with an extraterrestrial of what he believes to be an extraterrestrial, but also when he was giving his interview decades after he had retired, there are pictures of his arm that has a probe in it as well. This just this this foreign object in his body. And I think I think the fact that you are dealing not just with your your regular fishermen because this was a fishing town but the 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 man El Jefe the one in control of the operation also had not one encounter not two but three mm -hmm. plus having evidence inside of him really does say something about this story and I think that's why it is just one of my all time favorite stories and I'm, I'm waiting i'm waiting for another one to compare i mean i'm still so new there's still so many cases i haven't covered yet but this one i could talk about it all day in like every single episode yeah it's fantastic it's just an amazing case uh and that's it there the military uh definitely uh well i factually they were involved but they were more involved in and knew more uh, than the public was even told, and all of the media in Brazil was there. They, this was a this was a heavily heavily covered case 
Um, but it was after the fact um, where the, it, it's revealed that uh, the, the the bodies were, you know, taken from one base to a hospital, uh, to another base, to another base, then flown to the United States. Um, so that means that the United States is involved in this case, and we would expect them to be. But uh, it is uh, just just it's 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 a, it's a crazy case. Crazy. It, crazy. it is. And, and on top of all of that, not only are you having physical evidence, again, photos of people having puncture wounds, but also you had two people die because of the incident. Do you know that uh, the, the Brazilian military admitted to videotaping for months? Right. Yeah. They had video crews. Camped they have 500 hours, um, 15 hours of film, 500 photos, 3,000 witness accounts, and 2,000 right. files were accumulated. That's right. That's right. Okay. So now I'm going to tell a Brazilian case. All right. Okay. All right. Hold on. Hold on. Can't go wrong with Brazil. I mean, especially their their cheese balls. You can't. What? Pan de queijo. So delicious. Is that what they're called? Yeah, they're like they're like these like fried little cheese balls. Oh, I got the cue. Jacques Vallée. Jacques Vallée sitting in front of uh oh, hold on for a second. Oh no, I can't do this. Hold on. I need to uh take it down. Take it down. Okay. Take it down. Take it down, right. take it down real quick. Down. Take it down real quick. Okay. It's down. Okay. Okay, we're doing it okay, again. Back up. <laughs> <laughs> Jacques Vallée, 1957. Uh, Ubatuba. It's Ubatuba, Brazil. And this case has been talked about a lot. I've talked uh, specifically to Jacques about this case uh, a couple of times, specifically about this picture here. Sitting in front of Jacques are three uh, vials of evidence of uh, debris. And you can see in back of him, that is an electron microscope. Obviously, he is in a laboratory that he works at. He's got racks. When I say rack, he's got rack. You know the spice rack in your kitchen with all the little spices? That's what Jack, no, he does, he does it. He, he can rotate it. Uh-huh, Ubatuba. Let's look at Ubatuba. And that's what he's got in front of him right here. Ubatuba happened in 1957. But here, here's the thing. There was a claim that a UFO exploded in the sky. And now uh, he gets sent the fragments. He gets uh, the test. The results of the test were published. Uh, showing that the fragments to be made of very pure magnesium. Always magnesium when it comes to alien debris. I don't know why. Um, with ver various other trace elements. But here's the situation. Nobody knows the provenance of the Ubatuba fragments. Um, there are known, no, no known witnesses to the UFO, the UFO crash, um, uh, of them being dropped. There's nothing there. And the pieces were mailed by an anonymous source with no return address. And uh, even the date of the UFO event itself is not known, but Jock has told me and stated that it was September 7th 1957. If you go and search that date, UFO 1957, you can do whatever you want, Jacques Vallée, Ubatuba, and there's virtually nothing um, online about this case. As as big of an event, and he's got uh, the debris, um, the, the testing and the published results of those tests uh, are out there, but the event itself... Uh, the exact dates, uh, witnesses, uh, who sent him the fragments, uh, certainly the provenance of and the chain of custody with those pra uh, with those fragments, completely unknown. But they've been in his possession for a number of years. But I mean, 
you know, you know, it's a good story. You know, you're having, you know, it's going to be really interesting when you receive something and there's no return address. Uh, yeah, I get that stuff all the time. <laughs> it makes you question, what stuff. the heck is this? Who sent it? Why did they send it? There's so many other people you could send it to. to. Why did you send it to A, right? So, uh, <laughs> what happened? pretty cool stuff. What happened? No, I mean, talking about this, talking about know. receiving something with no return address, especially when it's relating to a, a piece of evidence. Yep. Yeah. Whenever my office calls, okay, you got a package today. Who's it from? No return address. Send it back. We can't <laughs> keep it. <laughs> yeah. Take like it home. Take it home. I'm not opening it up. No, because then you got like this powder and then bam, you only yeah. have a few days to live. Yeah, not exactly my first concern, Christina, but that's down. Oh. It's like number three. <laughs> it's like number three. <laughs> well, then what's the first concern? Uh, It'll be mine. Body parts. <laughs> <laughs> See Christina's face. I can <laughs> just, you are so, you know, Christina, this is the thing. Um, your fascination and the importance of the subject, um, uh, you know, and you're so serious about it and everything else, but you're also so pure. And and a, and a joke like that, it takes a minute for you to even hear it. <laughs> it takes like 30 seconds. Your brain's processing. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Eject, eject. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I love it. I love it. Okay, what's next? I have no idea. What are we doing next? Look about the Betty Cash incident and her okay. side effects. Yeah, we can do some cash, some cash and Landrum. Cash and Landrum. So, in Hoffman, Texas, very close to Houston, Texas, on December in 1980, you have Vicki Landrum, her seven-year-old grandson, Colby, and a friend of Vicki's, Betty Cash. And let me tell you, their lives were changed forever. They saw what then appeared to be a kind of illumination one would expect to see on an aircraft. The light appears to be nothing less than a mass of fire in the sky. Then... Very, very quickly, the light descended close to the ground as in barely 25 feet above the surface of the road. And you just saw this, this diamond-like object, one with a blue row of lights. And then you had these three witnesses, and they were pretty close to this, to this incident. And they definitely saw consequences first well for all three of them they began to have these symptoms of like a bad food poisoning they suffered from dehydration severe diarrhea headaches um sickness burns. right burns yeah. as well but it was betty cash that was definitely hit the hardest um during this this incident to the point where she broke out in sores, her hair began to fall out, and that just goes to show that is radiation poisoning. So you had entire patches of her head becoming exposed as the days progressed. And it was by then, you know, definitely time to hit the emergency room. And when she was there for nearly a month, OK, the, the doctors were just completely baffled by this intensity of issues she was having with her body. So again, sores, hair was was just falling apart. She was having once again suffering from dehydration, diarrhea, headaches. And the doctors were like, how did this happen? And I can just imagine her attempting to tell this story and the doctors being like, this right. this this girl is out of her mind. There's no there's no way. So at, at this point, you know, probably when she she got that reaction and here I'm just guessing I'm not sure. I feel like she would kind of just not tell her story after that of 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 what happened. And these are two of the women that were involved. But it's it's traumatic. It just goes to show while many of us may be really excited to if we see a craft land, we're like, yeah, dude, take me anywhere. I want to be off this planet. Mm -hmm. You do really have to consider that there that there are consequences. 
health consequences. Have you, uh, excuse me. Have you ever watched an interview with them? There's a few out there. You ever seen any, any of that stuff from TV? I have not. No, oh, yeah. Just go. And, and, and you cannot deny that this family is just telling it like it happened. That's it. I'm just saying it's crazy as it, it's a, it's, it's a crazy case, you know, drive down the road, craft lands in front of you. And, uh, you're curious. You want to go, you think it's, you think it's God, you think it's angels, you go for it and bam, you know, and, and they tell the story and I've got to, I'm just telling you, it's the way that they speak. Um, and it, 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 they look exactly like the, actually they're, um, well, anyway, uh, it's, it, it's in color. Um, but go and watch it. And, and that's where I think with anybody, uh, that's an opportunity to apply discernment where you can read people, their body language, you can see yeah. their eyes and, and the way that they speak and how they, they talk through this. Um, and you've got two people or three people um, that are telling about the same encounter, the same event, whatever it is, um, they need to be able to uh, tell the story with coordination. If you right. can't do that, somebody's lying. Right. Okay. And that's, that's not the case here. Um, so if you ever get a chance, uh, Christina, definitely go and do that. I know that you love this case and you've been in a, we've talked about it. I don't know how many times over the last year. Um, it's a fantastic case. Go and watch the few interviews, uh, that are out there. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing. I think we're talking about, we've been talking about this for a year. It blows my mind that we've been doing this show for a year. <laughs> I just want yeah. to state that. Yeah. Now, and nothing but fresh material week nothing after week. After, except for Catch Landrum. We're going to run that baby into the ground. And probably Kolaris Brazil as well, because <laughs> I'm okay with that. Like, I'm not complaining. And season three, <laughs> Skinwalker Ranch. All right. All right. Let's, let, uh, let's, um, let's do this one next. I'm looking at the clock. I, I've got a couple of things. So I, I at least want to get this one in. Uh, this next case um, is uh, involves uh, an assistant professor at the Earth Science uh, of Earth Science at the New Mexico Military Institute. His name is Frank Kimbler, and he decided to go out in 2011 and and go through the Roswell uh, crash site. So he does, and then he ends up discovering. Uh, a bunch of material from there. Are you sharing? Oh, look at you. Wow. I'm, yeah, that's I'm him. On it. Yeah, that's him. Frank Kimbler. And so he ends up discovering uh, several uh, very small pieces of metal that he had tested at a laboratory. And then he announced that the results showed magnesium. Magnesium isotope ratios in the sample that were different from those uh, of Earth. Uh, proving a possible extraterrestrial origin. A review of the results by another lab disagreed, though, noting that the anomalous result was not as significant as stated since error bars of the analysis were not taken into account. Now, um, hold on for a second, because I have to do uh, I have to do one thing here before I can officially go. There it is. I like this cue. Yeah, I well, like because only I know it. I like it. nobody has seen this before. They have no idea. But uh, th there's a lot of uh, material. Uh, this is this is one piece, one fragment. You can see uh, it's about an inch and a half long. Um, you can see right there. It's next to uh, the tape measure. It's a uh, six centimeter, eight centimeters, about an inch and a half long. Again, uh, uh, magnesium, magnesium, magnesium. And then uh, here's another uh, piece of his debris. Let me pop that up. Oh, you can't. Can you? Can you not see that? Okay, hold on for a second. Unless you have it like in the same folder, then you're able to just kind of like move over. Otherwise, no, you're going to have to unshare and reshare it. Christina, throw me under the bus after the show, not during the show. Oh, okay. 
Okay. Can you, can you do that for me? Yes. Can Luckily do, I don't have a bus. Can you do that for me? Okay. All right. There's another piece, um, uh, again, about an inch and a half long, um, uh, apparently uh, a magnesium isotope as well. Uh, again, not uh, not bearing the same uh, characteristics of terrestrial magnesium and some of the things that have been developed from it and uh, different versions and alloys. Um, but there you go. Uh, very interesting. Don't know. You know, uh, this was a 2011 Mm-hmm. And, uh, th- 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 you know, I, here's, here's the thing I'm going to make, I'm going to make one obnoxious comment, um, that, that I keep going back to, uh, is this worth going public over, you know, stuff like this, right? Is this, is this worth it or why don't we have something definitive? A seat, right? Uh, uh, a, a piece of a uh, an instrument cluster, a dashboard. I mean, we uh, are aware yeah. after all of the alleged crashes, right? The retrievals are incredibly, impeccably done, cleaned, done very quickly as well. You know, why is it always, but why is it always melted, bent, dripped stuff? You know, why don't we have, uh, you know, so men in black, yes, is the government coming in? Is it impossible to, to have this stuff in your home? Uh, you know, are, you know, is it just confiscated? Probably. I mean, if you had, if you had, okay, let's go back to Bigelow for a second. So Bigelow comes out. And it is said, not only from Bigelow, but I think Tom DeLong said this, and uh, everybody just save your email if I get some of this wrong, but but I'm, I'm right on, on, on the idea of this, is that Bigelow comes out and says, hey, I have a warehouse, secret guarded warehouse in Las Vegas, full of alien debris. And we're analyzing, we've got this, we've got that, and this, and that. These were the statements that were made. And my point is, and this came from George Knapp, and this came from, okay. So if you're going to make these statements, then go public. Don't, um, uh, and that includes, this is where I, you know, I have to uh, make a comment, you know, to somebody like a George Knapp, who is a very responsible journalist. And, and he's in Nevada. He's got, uh, you know, his relationship with Bigelow. And if these statements are going to be made, the, which we're talking about the, the debris of probably the most important stuff in the history of the world, that's what it is. It's the most important stuff ever. You go public, you have a press conference, you present what you have. It's that's it. Then it's game over, and we can start moving forward on this. And and this is a public thing. Don't uh, don't say that you can't. That you've got to continue to have. So let's see it. Let's see it presented in a press conference, live on television, and and let's get to the bottom of it. That way, there is no men in black. There is no confiscation. There isn't anything else. You're not going to be made a martyr, right, that this is public knowledge. And this is the problem that I have uh, with some of these claims, that there is uh, there's debris, but we just can't talk about it. Uh, we can't show it. We can't do this. Ah, well, man. I'm going to I'm going to play devil devil's advocate here. And people that have come out stating that, that they have debris, that they have evidence and they've shown it. They've been marked as crazies, as liars, as hoaxers. Right. Um, and, and then they sometimes disappear or sometimes they're placed in jail for a crime that from like 20 years ago, something like this. So it could be very well. And again, I'm merely playing devil's advocate here. And the, Christina, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in and say that uh, you have to play devil's advocate here. And I totally respect that and appreciate that. The difference is though, it's 2022 
And this is now a subject that it isn't ridiculed and it can be discussed and you can go public and you can do this and your job is going to be safe. You know, this isn't 1975, 1985. It was a different world. And you're absolutely right with that. Today, the Pentagon's having press conferences about it. So I think you're pretty much in the safe zone. And if you do go public, you have a live, that's, that's it. The government can't come in and do anything about it. That you're, you're protected with that now. So I, I think uh, uh, I think that Bigelow, if he does have stuff, he needs to just go completely, completely public. Nobody cares. Nobody's good. They we already think he's crazy. What he's going to be crazier, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, he already went on sixty minutes and said ET is here. And I'm okay with it, right? Come on. You know, so if you have debris, if you have stuff, if you have a seat, can you imagine if, if Bigelow rolled out one of these? Got this from my 1957 crash site. You know, it, let's see it. Let's see it. Jacques Valet, right? And uh, Dr. Heineck carrying this off of the Socorro sight <laughs> a chair throwing it in the back of the car but but there there's probably stuff out there like that um uh, everything wasn't disintegrated into little molten little globules right that there's there's got to be stuff out there so let's see it christina great show well Thank something you. that i do want to mention before yeah. you run off and because look, I, I can I can agree with you in some aspects, but if there are still military industrial compartmentalized agents who want to keep the lid on these things, th these these things, you know, sighted defense, sighting defense significance, then it's a problem. Right. I mean, yeah. I would I would think very hard before releasing such information to the public. Well, I mean, at least to like my my newbie status in, in this topic. Mm hmm. No, it's fair enough. Fair enough. But um, I'm going to give you this piece of advice. If you do get the crazy email uh, with the with the pictures, reach out to a couple of your friends, some of the pictures, and see what's up. But then after that, you go public. You don't play around. You don't you don't play around. Uh, that's on YouTube. That's on your website. That's in Twitter. And you protect yourself with that and you get it out there and everybody gets to see it. And, and, and that's it. That's what you do. That's what I've always done. Yeah. You've been that's a really good example of that with the Malibu base with this mm -hmm. piece of debris that you just showed, showed us a little bit earlier. Sure. You know, you're, you're not someone that has a hidden agenda of like, well, I'm going to keep this information until I like crossover or something. No, you're, you're very transparent. <laughs> You know, there's a, uh, I don't want to, uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, do this on your show. I would never do that to you, but there's a certain researcher, no, a certain, uh, UFO, uh, egocentric celebrity out there that, um, is interested in clicks, but, but he wants to make, you know, these generalized statements of, you know what, I'm the keeper of the UFO secrets. You know, I, I have the secrets and, and, you know, when, when, when I think it's, 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 you know, and, and when they'll let me and and to imply that is wrong, right? To imply that if it, if it is true, it's wrong. It's the wrong position to have, but those that say those things aren't the keeper of secrets, right? They're simply not there. You, you don't have anything because you would be the most famous person in the world if you release these secrets and they would have a religion in your name in a hundred years. Seriously. I'm not kidding about that. Well, what's that? I'm, I'm, I'm ready. For, I'm ready to see them on, on stained glass like this. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. Who is in that stained glass uh, artwork, daddy? That's the guy that revealed the UFO secrets in 2022. That's what would happen, Christina. So well, at least, at least tell us the initials. No, the I, no I wouldn't do that to you. No, 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 no. Wouldn't it? No, I, I nah, nah, I, I, but I'll call you in five minutes and I'll tell you, but here's the thing. Um, those that do come forward like Kindler and, 
and whatever. At least they're trying, right? Yeah. They're not scared. They don't know. They don't know. They've got this. They've dug the stuff out of the ground. You know, Roswell, crash site, whatever, UFO landed in the backyard. They found this Rendlesham, whatever it is, right? Um, they're at least trying, you know, to say that I've got the stuff, man. I've got the videos. I've got the That's evidence. Good. I've got everything. I've got everything, but I am the keeper of the UFO secret. You know what? Man, stop it. You, you, you don't have anything. All right. I got to go. I'll see everybody tonight on Fader Night. Christina, right. another fantastic, amazing show. Man, you are the future of everything. Thank you so much, Christina. I'll see you tonight on the show. Thank you, everybody. Behave and be well. Get me out of here, Christina. Bye, Jimmy. All right. Well, that is the end for today's show. Which was your favorite story that we covered? For myself, while I can talk about it a thousand times, it's still Colaris Brazil. I, I It's still my favorite case. <laughs> but that's just me. I want to say thank you to everyone in the live chat, all of my amazing moderators, all the super chats, the super stickers, YouTube members, Patreon subscribers. This simply is not possible without you. And I do want to let you know, practically all of the funds are going straight into the RV to give you the absolute best, coolest content, hitting all those really sweet hot spots. I want to wish you all a wonderful day. Come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. PST to watch Strange Paradigms, where I cover all the strange news and mysterious headlines from around the world. So make sure to hit the notification bell if you are watching this on YouTube. Be safe. And remember, keep your eyes on the skies.